Amen. So Deuteronomy chapter 6, getting right into it. It says there in verse 1, Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's sons, all the days of thy life. So, you know, this chapter really, what it's dealing with is the next generation. I mean, they're, he's bringing them into land, but we'll see here in the beginning and the end, you know, God is really putting a lot of emphasis on uh, this current generation teaching the next uh, these important statutes, these judgments, so they would continue to do them and to keep them, and which, you know, the ones that he's uh, commanding them. Now look there in verse 3 where it says, Hear therefore Israel and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, uh, that you might increase mightily as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee. Again, you know, just reminding us again, you know, Deuteronomy, we're hearing the uh, statutes and judgments, do them, obey the Lord your God, hear, O Israel, it's coming up over and over again. And it's not because God is just trying to bind a heavy burden on people. You know, God doesn't just have a bunch of rules because he just wants to make life difficult or something. And we'll talk a little bit here at the end, but he's, he's giving them these things. Why? That it may be well with thee, that ye may be increased mightily as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee. You know, God has our best interest in mind with all of these commandments. That's what he's trying to uh, get across here for our own good. Now look there in verse 4, of course, that's a very uh, famous verse where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now this is a verse that's often corrupted. It's a verse that you find often uh, twisted into mean, uh, to, take, uh, to mean something else in a lot of false Bible versions. You know, the Jews, they, they, uh, they teach uh, false teaching about this. And basically what they all do is they drop off the Lord at the end there. So the, the, that verse in, in many of these Bible versions reads, Hear, O Lord, uh, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And if you pay attention to that, you can see how that completely changes the meaning yeah, right. by just dropping off the Lord at the end there. And, you know, that's what a lot of these false Bible versions do. And it changes major doctrine. That should be a lesson to us. You know, why are we King James only? Because even if something as simple as just dropping one word, one name, just changing one little thing can, can completely change the meaning of a verse. You know, the NIV quotes it like this. The Lord our God, it, the Lord is one. Okay, that sounds completely different than what the King James is trying to say here. Right. Uh, the New King James even. Hear, O Israel, right? The New King James, the one that, that, that's approved, right? Wrong. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. So that's, that's a very different meaning than, than what the King James Bible has. Now, there are some translations, they get the meaning of the verse right, but they're still, you know, we could probably find multiple errors with them. The New Living Translation says, Listen, O Israel, the Lord uh, is our God, the Lord alone. Now, they have at least got the meaning right. You know, that, that, that's what the King James is trying to express here. The Lord our God is one Lord, meaning there's no other God besides Him. Uh, the ESV, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, the, the, the HCSB, I don't even know what that is. Listen, Israel, uh, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The New American Standard, the NASB, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our, our God, the Lord is one. So this has been corrupted in a lot of them. Now the message, which is probably one of the worst translations you could ever pick up, actually has the meaning right. It says, attention Israel, God our God, the God the one and only. So they, at least they got the meaning behind it. When he's trying to say there's only one God. But when I was writing that and I, I looked that up, I thought, you know, it just shows you how stupid these versions are. They read so terribly. Right. I mean, the message reads like this, attention Israel. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like you so you'd hear this like in a PA system in an airport, you know, you know, like someone's trying to tell you your headlights on, you know, whoever has the license plate, attention, attention, you know, you're, you've left your lights on and the, and the, and the white Corolla, you know, whatever. It, it, it just, it sounds bad. And, you know, it just goes to show you, even if you get the meaning right, you know, they, they, they botch it everywhere else. Attention, Israel. So, um, you, you know, and this, we could really go on and on about this. We'll touch on this here. Uh, this could be a whole sermon in and of itself, like many other things that we preach at in these uh, verse by verse uh, one Thursday nights. And there's been a lot of uh, sermons about this, uh, you know, preaching against this oneness uh, heresy that's out there, preaching, you know, in defense of the Trinity. But uh, <coughs> what this verse is saying here in verse 4, where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, is what it's trying to, to, to get across is the sense that there is no other God. That there's no other God to turn to. He is the one Lord. Because right. you have to remember the word God is just a name that everyone uses for God. You know, the, you know, the Allah, you know, it just means God. You know, so God is, you know, if you believe in God, God is just a name you're going to use for God. But what he's saying here is the Lord, our God, is one Lord. There's only one Lord. 
And that's what he's trying to get across. And if you recall, I'll quote for you from Deuteronomy 4, where we were for you a few weeks ago, it says, Know therefore this day, and consider it in thine heart, that the Lord, he is God in heaven above, and upon the earth beneath, there is none else. That's what's trying to be expressed here, is that there is only one God, not that God is just one person. But that's what these, uh, you know, these new translations would have you to think, that, there is only, that God is one person. Uh, now, God is singular in the sense of being exclusive. Okay, that's what you could say that. Yeah, there's only, God is one in the sense that there is only one God. That would be correct. He said in Isaiah chapter 42, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. You know, and it's kind of interesting, you know, there in Isaiah and also here in Deuteronomy where he's just drilling, uh, you know, this, this issue of idolatry and not making graven images. You know, he, he emphasizes the fact that he, is the he alone is God. Uh, you know, both as Isaiah and Deuteronomy, they invoke, you know, God's unshared claim as God in the context, you know, as opposed to uh, idolatry. So God is singular in terms of being exclusive. That's the singularity of God. He is the only Lord God. There is none else besides him. But God, make no mistake about it, is plural in his nature. Right? We all know Genesis, let us make man in our image. Let us make God in our image. That's speaking to the triune nature of God, the plurality in God's uh, a person. You know, 1 John 5, 7, 4, there are three that bear record in heaven. You know, there are three in heaven. Okay? So, and again, we could go on and on about this. And there's a lot more in this chapter I'd like to talk about, but you can't really read that verse without at least touching on it and, and pointing out the fact that there's a lot of false doctrine that's promoted by people just taking one word out of that verse and leaving it off. And it just changes everything that that verse is supposed to mean. You know? But uh, we'll move on here. In verse 5 it says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and thou talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and when thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as the frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of the high house uh, and on thy gate. So again, God, you know, is already bringing up the next generation again. We already read where he's going to command them, thy son and thy son's sons. And now he's saying you're going to teach them diligently unto thy children. So God is putting a lot of emphasis here on us instructing the next generation. You know, and that's something we cannot lose sight of. You know, we got a great thing going here at Faithful Word Baptist Church. We got a lot of, uh, you know, young, younger people, young families that are, on, are zealous, they're on fire for God. But you know, that could all disappear in a generation. That could all be gone in one generation. I mean, that's what happens uh, very quickly. We see that over and over again in the Bible. You know, another generation that rises up that doesn't know the Lord. And they go after idolatry. They, they go into sin. They forget the, the, the God of the Bible. You know, if we're not careful, we don't put the emphasis where God does. And God here, I mean, make no, make no mistake about it. It's, it's plain as day. He puts emphasis on teaching the next generation the statutes and the commandments of the Bible. You know, that's why it's important to have all the, the young people in the main service. You know, where they can hear the preaching of the Word of God, where they can hear all the, the doctrinal teaching and all the, the, the do's and don'ts of the Word of God instead of just, you know, sticking them off and just telling them the same old, you know, stories about, you know, the animals getting on the ark. Those are great. Let's teach them that. But let's teach them the whole counsel of the Word of God. Let's get everybody here and let's teach the next generation because that's where God puts the emphasis. <clears throat> so the importance of teaching the next generation of the, thing, the, of the things of God. That's an important thing that we need to do. So how are we going to do that? How are we going to teach the next generation? How are we going to implore them to you know, uh, take heed to these things? Well, for, it has to start with us. It has to start with the, 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 you know, the, the generation that precedes them. It has to start with the moms and dads. And it says there, you know, it, it, it really it begins in thine heart. He said in verse 5, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart. You know, if you want your kids to follow in your footsteps, you know, you're going to be the one that has to love God. You know, kids, you know, they, 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 you're, the old saying goes, your talk talks, or your walk talks louder than your talk talks. I mean, we can say all the right things, but if we're not doing them, you know, that, that's going to, that's not going to guarantee that, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're the next generation is going to follow in our footsteps. They might say, well, yeah, they said a lot of things, but they weren't sincere in what they were doing. And so it starts with us. It starts with, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. <laughs> and these words which I command thee shall be in thine heart. 
right? And thou shalt teach them diligently unto, or, unto thy children. So you want to know how to get your kids to follow the Lord and live for God? It has to start with your own heart. It has to start within you. It has to be in your heart to love the Lord thy God uh, with all thy might. It has to be in, the words of God have to be in your heart, in your mind. You have to, uh, they have to see these things come from, out, uh, from within, in, within, within yourself. So it starts with you, you know, in thine heart. And, you know, this is something that's reiterated in, in Scripture. Colossians says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. In Psalm 119, Where was shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee, O let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. You know, you can't go hide God's word in somebody else's heart. You can't just, you know, twist your kid's arm and get them to follow the Lord. And they, they, they have to be inspired. They have to be moved. They have to see that it's real, that it's genuine, that and they have to see the why behind what we're doing. That there's, there's a reason behind why we have these standards. We, there's reasons why we believe what we believe. And uh, they can make their own decisions as they grow older, but, you know, we should be that good example to them and not a stumbling uh, block. So really, you know, leadership is something... You know, and specifically parenting, you know, which is, you know, <laughs> leadership. Uh, it needs to be directed from within by the word of God. It's something that has to come from within and then come back. Go ahead and turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 17. You know, you want to lead your house. You want to lead your family. You want to lead your kids to follow the Lord. You know, it, has to st it starts with you. Uh, and, and, you know, with any, any form of leadership. Someone wants to lead a church. They want to, you know, any, in any form of leadership. If you're trying to lead people to follow God, you know, it only makes sense that it has to be genuine with you, that it has to be something that is real with you. Look there in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 18. And it shall be when he sees, and this is talking about the king, when they would set up a king in Israel. It shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book uh, w uh, out of that which is before the priests and the Levites. Now, how would you like that? <laughs> you have to sit, you want a copy of the Bible, you got to sit down and write it by yourself. You got to sit down and hand, hand write it. You know, that, maybe that would do some people some good. I don't know. Maybe it would probably make us not take the Word of God uh, for granted. You know, we have so many Bibles just laying around. You know, we clean up the church at, 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 uh, up there in Phoenix, and, like, we've got boxes of old used Bibles that people just leave behind. You know, it's like, you know, are you missing this thing? It's been sitting here for months, you know? And, it, and maybe if they had to sit down and actually pen those words out by hand, they, they would probably make that a little bit more precious to them. I'm, I know a guy, he didn't write it by hand, but he, uh, he actually... He took, he had, a, he was into like fonts and making, he was a graphic designer. So he designed his own font and he actually copy and pasted the word of God into his own font and then and bound it in a book. He had his own handmade Bible that he printed, you know, and he, that book, that was precious to him. I mean, that thing was dog-eared. It had all the, the, you know, the, the dirt marks from you're always thumbing in it. You know, it had that one bend where from where the guy was always holding it. It was a real precious book to him, you know. And it was the same words that are in every other Bible. You know, but his was, he, he was invested in that. And I remember the day he lost it. He came to me at church and he was like, man, I lost my Bible. I was like, oh man, my heart broke a little bit for him. You know, he's like, I don't know what happened. I think I left it on top of the hood. I've done that, you know, get in the car to go to church and leave the Bible on top. Look in the rear view and just see, you know, fluttering off there. <laughs> Pulling over. So, uh, you know, but the point being, you know, if you had to sit down and actually write out, maybe, you know, we wouldn't take it for granted. I'm, maybe, you know, no one in here is, hopefully, but... Uh, hey, if that's a problem, maybe here's a solution. Sit down, write it down, right? But uh, the point being, you know, we should not take the word of God for granted. If we're going to be the type of leadership, if we're going to be the example that we need to be the next generation, it's got to be in our heart. You know, we gotta we gotta love the Lord. We gotta love His word. He says in verse 19, "It shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life." How are we going to teach our children the words of God if we're not reading it every day? How are we going to teach the commandments and the statutes and the judgments, you know, all the deep things of God, all the important doctrines of God, if we're not reading it? Uh, we need to be reading therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words uh, of this law and his statutes to do them, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or, the, or to the left. You know what's going to keep you in the way? You know what's going to keep you walking on the straight and narrow? What's going to keep you right with God is if you're in the book. You know, it says daily, you know, reading all the days of thy life. You don't want to depart to the right. You don't want to depart to the left. You want to stay, you know, right with God. You need to get in the Word. Be reminded of who it is that you're dealing with, you know, the, you know, the Lord, and and reminded what He approves of and what He disapproves of. And uh, you know, 
the importance of teaching the next generation, it's not just going to happen. You know, it's not just going to happen on its own. We're going to have to be, you know, there's going to be some intent behind it and some sincerity. Look there in uh, Deuteronomy where you were. You know, it's going to take effort. It's going to take uh, sincere effort. He says there in verse 7, uh, <coughs> And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Diligently. You know, that's, that's uh, you know, saying, hey, this is going to take work. This is something you're going to have to do, put some effort behind it. It's going to have to be something you'll be diligent about, not slack on. You know, when we get busy as parents, it's real easy to do that. And just to say, well, you know, they're in church three times a week, and, you know, we're busy with all these other things. And, you know, and we forget to ask them, hey, have you, re have you read your Bible today? Have you gotten into the Word of God? Or, you know, taking the time to teach some things out of the Word of God. That's something you have to be diligent to do. It's going to take effort. You know, it's going to take consistency. He says there, And thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. I mean, what part did he miss of your day right there? You know, it's when you, when you sit in your house, when you're walking by the way, when you're not in your house, when you're, when you're laying down, and when you rise up. Morning, noon, and night. God's saying, hey, you're going to teach him these things. What's, that, what's he trying to get across here? You got to be consistent. Yeah. You know, you got to be constantly. You, have to be, and you can see why it says diligently teach them these things, right? You, you got to teach them diligently. You have to be consistent. You know, walking the walk, not just talking the talk. I mean, I, I've seen it. Nothing will destroy, uh, you know, a, a young person like a hypocrite. Right. You know, the, I've seen guys, kids that growing up in good Christian homes just go completely off the rails because, you know, dad or mom were a hypocrite in some area. Now, does that make it right? No, it doesn't make it right. But is that the nature of things? It is. That's what happens. You know, uh, <coughs> so we don't want to be a hypocrite. Now, warning to the children, okay? Your parents are sinners just like you, okay? So, you know, it's a wicked heart that would just sit back and try to pick apart their parents, right. try to find some, you know, excuse to quit on God or to get out of the Christian life. Oh, say, oh, it's all fake. It doesn't matter anyway because your parent was, you know, wasn't perfect in some area. You know, we're parents. We're, we're flesh and blood. We're going to mess up. We're going to make mistakes. You know, see, some of us are first generation uh, Christians trying to figure this thing out as we go, you know. Right. We didn't have a godly example for us. We're trying to do the best we can. And uh, either way, whether we had that or not, you know, we're still just flesh and blood. So kids, you know, should, should take heed too and not just sit back and be the type of per person that's just going to say, well, you know, my dad or my mom, they were just wrong in this one. They had one little thing wrong or they did this wrong or they, they offended me in some area or they were, they were a hypocrite in this area and now I'm just going to quit on God. The whole thing's fake, blah, 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 and they just go off and you know, that's their excuse. Right. That's a wicked heart that looks for that kind of thing. Now, we as parents, again, consistency, diligence, we should, we should make effort to not let that be the case. But can that type of thing happen? Of course it can. <laughs> it's going to take effort. It's going to take consistency. It's going to take keeping God's word always before you. I mean, that's what he's saying here. Between thine eyes. You know, you see it throughout the day. Like he told the king, he shall have it with him always. It will always be with him. You know, we should make an effort to always have the word of God with us. You know, and again, we're living in a day where we have a multitude of Bibles. They come in all shapes and sizes. You can get the little New Testament, slip them in your pocket. You can write them on three by five cards best thing you could probably do is memorize it and put it in your heart like we read earlier hide it in your heart and you'll always have the word of god with you between thine eyes always meditating and always thinking about the word of god throughout the day <coughs> you have to you're gonna you know why are you doing that so that you can help teach these things to the next generation to be that godly example you know upon he says you shall write it upon the post of thy house and on thy gates you know it's gonna be hard to leave your house and not see it if it's on the post you know, we, and, and you know, we, if you try this, by the way, here's a recommendation. Change the verse every so often, you know. We put one up on our door, and it's been there so long, it's just like part of the scenery. You know, you, after a while, you forget it's even there. You know, it's, it's good to kind of switch it out. Just maybe put a verse on your door that you look at. When you go reach for that, that doorknob to walk, let yourself out, you see a Bible verse. Amen. So when you're walking out of your house, you're walking out of the gates of your house, you know, you're, you're thinking on the Word of God on your way down the driveway. On thy gates, you know, when you're coming and going, you're going to be seeing the Word of God. When you come back home, you know, you're, you're going to be thinking about the Word of God. It's always going to be before you. That's the important thing. 
So what's he saying here? Look, if you're going to teach the next generation these things, it's not going to happen on its own. You're going to have to be diligent. You're going to have to be consistent. You're going to have to wor have the Word of God dwelling in your heart. And he's telling you this is how you're going to get the Word of God in your heart, by having it before your eyes, on the gates of thy house, on the posts of thy house. It's, it's just going to be a part of your life. It's, it's, it's the fabric of your being. You, know, you are uh, just a, you know, interwoven with the Word of God. <clears throat> and look there in verse 10. He says, And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall brought thee into the land which he swore to thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and wells dig which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and, be, eaten and be full, then beware lest thou uh, forget the Lord, God, uh, the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. So remember, they're going into a land that's already inhabited. And, and it's not just a, it's not a, you know, a scorched earth policy. It's not slash and burn. It's, it's remove the people and then we're going to dwell in their houses. We're going we're gonna to eat of their vineyards. God's giving them all these things. You know, they're, they're going to be sitting in somebody else's furniture. You know, it's, it's like, uh, it makes me think of, you know, Goldilocks, except, you know, the three bears aren't coming home. You know, they get to try all the porridge. They're going to get to sleep in all the beds and sleep in whatever chair suits them best. It's, they're, they're, you know, they're going to get all these things. And God's warning them, saying, look, I'm giving you all these great things. And here's the danger. You're going to take them for granted. And, you know, this is really, and this is something the Bible talks a lot about, is the danger of prosperity. And if you keep something there and turn over to uh, Proverbs chapter 1, Proverbs chapter 1. When you get to Proverbs, keep something there because we're going to look a lot of verses. Because this is, a, this is a strong warning. And, you know, we that live in a prosperous country would do well to take heed to this. I mean, I know that we didn't end up here because God, you know, brought us into this land and we, we chased out the heathen. You know, it, it's, it, there was probably some providence in our forefathers coming here and things like that. So it's not that kind of a case. But the fact is, you know, we in this generation, you know, we have what we have today because of the generations that went before us, because of our forefathers, because of the generations that, you know, carved out this country and, and gave us, you know, our freedoms and our liberties. And it's really easy for us in this generation to sit back and take that for granted because we have a lot of prosperity. Uh, you know, and, and I could, I mean, do we really have to be convinced of our prosperity tonight? I mean, do we really think we have it that bad here? I mean, everyone in here has probably got a computer in their pocket. You know what I mean? It's, it's crazy, the country that we're living in. The things that, and we just take it for granted. You know, we, we get in our air-conditioned cars and we drive down here with the Bluetooth on, listening to some story and, you know, and, and then we go, and we, on the way, we just stop and get delicious food. I mean, right. Chick-fil-A, hello. That's, that's, we're in prosperity, my friend. Vanilla milkshakes, just I, I don't know, whenever we want it. You know, uh, EG's is down the corner. We just, we're, there's just food everywhere, entertainment everywhere. Just Raspados, amen to that. Amen. You know, Sonoran Delights. Only if you live in Tucson, though, right? <laughs> You can't get a you can't get a raspado anywhere else besides this place. I've tried it, man. I've, I've been to LA, tried to get one. It, it doesn't work, right? Not all raspados are created equal, you know. But hey, let's not take let's not take Sonoran delights for granted. Amen. You know, let's not get fat and sassy and think that you know we can just do whatever we want now, because here we are in the in the land that flow with raspados and EGs. Yeah. You know, we gotta we gotta guard our hearts. Seriously though, you know what I'm saying? Right. And that's what God's warning here. The danger of prosperity. Living in a country where everything's just at your fingertips. And especially in this generation where, where it's just everywhere. We, we are so at ease in this country. And, uh, you know, I, and, I, and, and, and I was just thinking about last night. I was, I was out soul winning in a very well-to-do neighborhood. You know, someone's back in their, their boat into their two-car garage and every, you know. And that's great. I'm not against people having nice things. But I tell you what, it, it affects people's hearts. And it makes them harden towards the things of God. They get comfortable. They think, oh, we don't need God. Right. You know, this country could stand a, a good economic recession to shake some people out of their safe little worlds right. and remind them that, you know, it is God that giveth the power to get wealth. Right. You know, that, that the, everything they have is given from God instead of just, you know, denying the Lord, not wanting to hear the Bible, hating on those that would preach it, you know, because, because why? Because they have everything they need. And they know not that they are rich, uh, naked and, and miserable and wretched and poor and blind, you know, spiritually speaking. So you're there in Proverbs. Look at verse, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 32. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 32. He says, For the turning the way of the simple shall slay them, 
and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. So is prosperity in, its, in and of itself an evil thing? No. I mean, that God gave them all these good things. He said, look, I'm going to give you all these things. But don't forget me. He says, you can have all these nice things. Just don't forget who it is that gave them to you. And who is, and who is it that gets destroyed? Uh, the, what is it that destroys uh, these people? They're prosperous. Yes. Is that what destroys them? No, it's because they're fools. And what is the fool? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Yeah. It's the fool that says, hey, you know, I, by my own power have I gotten all this wealth. You know, we don't need God. That's going to destroy you. That's going to bring you into judgment. And uh, <coughs> we should, you know, be careful about prosperity, the danger of it. You know, we should be grateful for wealth. We should be grateful for the fact that we live in a country where, you know, we have more than heart could wish. You know, we, sh we, you know, it, it, we probably do well to go visit some third world country where people are s literally sleeping on dirt floors. Yeah. You know, where people are, are living in actual squalor. Where indoor plumbing w is, you know, I, uh, I, you know, y you say, oh, the Wi-Fi went out. You know, <laughs> <laughs> there's some people they can't even, they have to walk miles to get water. Right. There's, you know, the, a lot of the world lives like that. So, you know, again, I'm not against prosperity. I'm not teaching us that, you know, we should just try to go and you know, all live like, uh, you know, some austere life, but just understand that God is the source of it. And that's what he's saying here. Look, you're going to come into all this land. You're going to have houses. You're going to have olive yards. You're going to have vineyards. You're going to have more than you need. And he's saying, beware, lest thou forget the Lord. That's the warning here. <coughs> Look there in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 7. You know, this should be our prayer in life. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 7. Two things I have, have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. You know, that's a good prayer to pray right there. You know, I don't want to be poor, but I don't want to have riches either. He goes on and says, uh, <coughs> Feed me with food convenient for me. You know, food that's appropriate. Food that, you know, is, is what I need. It's convenient for me. Lest I be fool and deny thee. See, that's the danger of prosperity. You know, get, you just get all you know, fat and sassy and get your toothpick out and well, who's the Lord anyway? You know, <clears throat> that's what happens to people and nations. Lest I be fool and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. Look, we don't want to have to live in poverty either where we're going around you know, committing sin, having to start you know, breaking into cars and, and stealing and selling things and just to try and survive we're just saying look we just we just want to we just want what we need to survive you know and to and to raise a family we don't how much more do we really need and <coughs> you know if you let the lord uh you know if you acknowledge him you know he's going to give you contentment in life that's what's going to make you content you know everyone's always there everybody's chasing after this you know the next greatest thing they all want the biggest and the best and the most of everything they can get their hands on it's, usually it's because they know it's people that don't even know God. They don't, they, don't, they don't care about the things of God, but when we start to care about the things of God and understand what really matters in this life, you know, serving God, winning souls, raising godly uh, family, you know, then all these material things start to kind of, you know, they vanish away. You know, when I set our affections upon things above, where neither rust nor moth doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal, you know, then we, you know, our treasures aren't upon this earth, they're in heaven. You know, true riches, when we start to desire those things, you know, that, then we're going to be satisfied with what God gives us here on earth. We'll say, hey, you know what? I've got enough. And, and, it could always, and here's the thing. If you ever find yourself becoming discontent, just remember, it could always be way worse than it is in this country. Oh, I'm so poor. You know, this suit coat's 10 years old. And it is. <laughs> just kidding, it's 11. But, uh, <laughs> you know, but hey, it's, it's still, it still fits. Um, but, uh, you know. <laughs> It's a little shabby in some areas, you know, but hey, I didn't hear any, I didn't get any dirty looks, you know, right. at least not for the, the coat's sake, you know. I, but I could say, oh, wh where's my three-piece? You know, where's my new suit? You know, whatever it might be. Oh, my car's 13 years old. You know, it doesn't have a, it doesn't have a USB charger in it. <laughs> you know, there's no GPS display. You know, everybody else has got a GPS display in their car. Woo! Well, does it run? Does it go down the road? Does it get where you need to go? Well, praise God. You know, it keeps you safe, gets you there. 
So, you know, we shouldn't sit around and just, and, you know, if we let God be, uh, you know, our, our true riches be in Christ, you know, then we're not going to desire all these other things. We're going to be satisfied if we don't forget the Lord, you know, and get caught up in just seeking more than we need. You know, we shouldn't, and if you would, uh, again, keep something in Proverbs, but turn over to Psalm 73. I, I, I want to go there just be, I know for the sake of time, we're kind of going long, but 70, Psalm 73 is just one of these great psalms. I, I remember reading this uh, early on in my Christian life, and this was just, you know, something that's spoken to me over the years, and, and it's just a great psalm here. I want to read this with a, uh, together. He says there in Psalm 73, verse 1, Truly, a God is good to Israel, even to such as of a clean heart. But as for me, my, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. Why? Verse 3, For I was envious at the foolish. And again, who were the foolish? Those that say there is no God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. He's envying these people that deny God. The foolish. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, you know, you start just lusting after the things of this world, that's going to vex your righteous spirit. That's going to vex you as a Christian. Especially if you sit, start, step back and start comparing yourself with the wicked. Because, let's face it, the wicked have more than heart could wish, don't they? It says, verse 4, For there is no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compassed them about as a chain, violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. I mean, it's be really easy to sit back and just start to envy these people. They just have all the world's luxuries, they've got all the money, they've got all the bling, they've got all the great toys. You know, they're, they're in need of nothing. They have more than heart could wish. But what does it say in verse 8? They are corrupt. They speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither and waters of a full cup are wrung out to him. And they say, how doth God know? And there is no, where and is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. You know who's real prosperous today? You know who's increasing in riches today? Wicked people that are doing the devil's bidding. You know, go look at the wealthiest people. Go look at the richest men and ask them about if they believe the Bible. Right. Ask them what they think about the commandments and the judgments and the statutes of God. You know, I'm sure you might find one. And, you know, I'm not saying they're all... I'm sure you could probably find one out there maybe that, that you know, loves the Lord and, and, and you know, uses his wealth to further king, the kingdom of God. I know that's out there, but by and large, if we're honest, you know, people that are just all about money and making riches, they're wicked people. Because it corrupts people. You know, money corrupts people. Power corrupts people. And <clears throat> prosperity, if we're not careful and we don't guard against it, we don't forget that it comes from God, it'll even corrupt us. I mean, why is God warning his own people about this? If that wasn't a possibility of being corrupted by prosperity, why does God have to even warn Israel about it? To say, oh, hey, you're going to come into all these nice houses and all these nice vineyards and everything like that, and don't worry about it. I know you won't forget me. Uh, it's, I know you guys are going to stay right with me all the way through. And not, you know, I don't even have to talk to you about it. No, God says, look, you're going to inherit all these things, things you didn't even have to hardly do any work for. And you know, the danger is beware, lest thou forget the Lord thy God. <coughs> That's the warning here. And really what we see, if you would turn back to Proverbs chapter 16, is that you know, if God lets us go a little lean in life, that's okay. If we don't have the best of everything and, and everything everybody else has, so what? You know, if we have the Lord, you know, we have all that we'll ever need. And there really, there is a kind of a virtue in a lack of abundance. I'm not saying if, you know, we have to, <laughs> you know, give up all our nice things and walk around in burlap for the rest of our lives. But, you know, there is a virtue in, in not having all these nice things. There's, you know, he's, you know, a virtue in having uh, a less, you know, um, it teaches us to appreciate what we do have. I mean, the Bible says that. I'll read to you from Proverbs 15. It says, Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Isn't that the truth? And you think about these people that, that who win the lottery. They get great treasure. You know what comes with that? A lot of trouble. A lot of people just start coming out of the woodwork. Just saying, oh, I heard you won the lottery. People get taken. They get held for ransom. People get killed. I mean, that's like one of the worst things that could happen in your life, winning the lottery. You're like, oh, I just a million. You know, that's all I need. Just to take the edge off. You know, that's all I want. You know, well, you know, you'd be surprised what a million dollars could do to somebody. 
He says, better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. It would be better to sit around and eat your kale and spinach you know, with someone that you love and someone that you know isn't going to do you dirty than to sit around and eat the T-bone and the, the sirloin and, and you know, the, the filet mignon and the pork roast and all that good stuff, right? Then with somebody that, you know, yeah, they're going to be cutting their steak one minute and then stabbing you in the back the next. Right. <coughs> Look at there, Proverbs 16. I mean, better is a little. There's a great... There's a great sermon title right there. I mean, better is a little with the fear of the Lord. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. Verse 16, how much better it is to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding rather to, and, and to get understanding rather to be chosen than silver. Verse 19, better it is to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. God's saying, look, it's better to have less. Less is more with God. Kind of like we preach Sunday night, less is more. You know, it's better to have little and have the Lord, little and have, you know, those that love the Lord in your life than having this abundance, this prosperity. Yeah. Proverbs 19 says, The desire of a man is his kindness, and a poor man is better than a liar. You know what? I, we might only drive one car, and we might, only, we might live in a two-bedroom apartment, and, uh, you know, this jacket might be 11 years old. You know, and I might not be some fat cat senator getting driven around in a limousine, but I'm not a liar. You know, at least I still have a good name. At least I'm not corrupt, you know, and speak lawfully of oppression. <coughs> better, is a, uh, better is a poor man than a liar. The fear of the Lord tendeth life, and he that uh, hath it shall abide satisfied. You want to be satisfied in life? Learn to fear the Lord. Learn to fear God and be thankful for what you have. And we're coming up on the Thanksgiving season, right? So here's, we're getting a little... You know, uh, the primer for the Thanksgiving sermon. Be thankful for what you have, fear God, and you'll be satisfied. Amen. <laughs> you shall not be visited with evil. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 6, Godliness with contentment is great gain. <clears throat> for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. You know, these guys that are just heaping up treasures to themselves, it's all staying. And they're going to get to the other side. They're going to die and wake up and have nothing. You know, and if they're not saved, they're going to end up in hell. Right. You know, or what about the saved guy who just made his life all about money, all about chasing riches? And then he, and he dies, he carries nothing out, and he gets to heaven. And it's like that illustration I had the other night. He gets to heaven, all his works are burned up, all he's got is a pile of ash. Yep. He's got nothing for eternity. No riches. Yeah, he's saved. But is that really, is that really all you want out of life, to just be saved? I got my fire escape. You know, I'm good to go. I got my ticket punched. Or do you want to get to heaven to have something waiting there for you? I mean, I want something waiting. I want to see what that mansion's going to look like. Literal mansion. I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I mean, it's a literal mansion up there. I mean, it gives us the dimensions in the New Jerusalem. It's huge. It's filled with mansions. That's where I'm going to live. You know, I want, I want to get that mansion up there. I'd rather have the mansion up there than, you know, the mansion down here. Because I've been in some mansions down here. And they're weak. <laughs> they're lame. There was no jasper. There was no pearl. There was no gold. There were no precious stones. It was just all the same stuff every other house is built out of. Stucco, you know, wood, drywall. It's just bigger and painted different. There's just more of it, you know. But he can keep that mansion. You know, I don't care if it's backed up to some fairway or something like that. You know, <coughs> I'll take the one in heaven. Yeah. That's the great gain in life. So those living in a, or a prosperous society, you know, we would do well to consider this chapter. You know, we have a lot of abundance today. We have a lot of ability to get wealth. And there's nothing wrong with getting wealth. If you do go about it the right way and for the right reasons, you know, if God prospers you and you do well in life and, 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 and you're able to have, you know, uh, an, uh, some wealth, great. Just don't forget the Lord in the process. And the danger is that's what happens. So maybe if God keeps us lean, if God maybe doesn't allow that to happen in our lives, instead of getting bitter and angry about it and envying the wicked, we should actually thank God and say, hey, at least he's keeping me on the right path. At least he's keeping me from turning into a terrible person. <clears throat> Because you know what? Despite this stern warning here in Deuteronomy and, and elsewhere, you know, God is warning this over and over again. That's exactly what happens to the children of Israel, isn't it? 
It's not long and they get into that land that flows with milk and honey. Right. They get all those vineyards, they get all those things that they didn't dig or build that were somebody else's that they just walked into yeah. and it's not long before they're worshiping heathen gods. They forget the Lord God and God has to start chastening them and reminding them who it is. Go back to Deuteronomy there. Well, we'll look at, pick it up back in verse 13. Deuteronomy, uh, <coughs> verse 13, where it says, <coughs> excuse me, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shalt swear by his name. Ye shall not go after other gods for the, uh, for the God, uh, of the gods of the people which are round about you, for the Lord thy God is a jealous God. And we talked about this earlier in other chapters where God talks about the fact that God is jealous. You know, jealousy is not a bad thing. And God, he's, he says, the Lord God, he says, my name is jealous. You know, that's God, one of God's names. He is a jealous God. Uh, and he goes on, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee. God's not mad at you. You know, that's a false, this false, this stupid philosophy that God's never angry. Yeah. Or that God would never get upset with anybody. Or that God would never even get upset with a, a child of his, you know, a believer in Christ. And that's exactly what happens. The anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee. You know, you go, ch you go wandering after these other gods, you get caught up in this, this false way. You'd say, well, that's, you know, they're the ones that are promoting the false god. Well, get angry with them. No, he gets angry with, with you. He gets angry with Israel for doing it. <coughs> I mean, God is angry with the wicked every day. We know that. But God will get mad at, even at his own people if, they, if they, uh, they cast him off, if they forget him. And destroy thee from off the face of the earth. You know, God hasn't changed. God is still the same today. And ye shall not tempt the Lord your God as ye tempted him in Massa. Ye shall, uh, ye shall diligently, and it will always be Massa from now on. By the I don't care how anybody else says it. <laughs> After the Massa conference, bam, Massa, right? I know it's spelled a little differently, but it all comes out the same. Massa. <coughs> Make America straight again. He shall diligently keep uh, the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes, which he hath commanded thee. Again, diligently keep them. Like, this is something you have to make a point of in your life. You know, just showing up to church three times a week or one time a week, whatever it is, that's great. I'm all for that. That's going to help. But, you know, this is something that you have to do on the daily. When thou risest up, when thou liest, uh, when thou liest down, when thou, you know, when you go out of your house, when you walk by the way, when you come in, when you go out, this is a daily thing that you have to do. That's why you have to do it diligently to keep his commandments. In verse 18, And thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord thy God, that it may be well with thee. Oh, all the do's and don'ts. Well, it's for your own sake. The rules are there for our benefit. That thou mayest go in and possess the good land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers. So really, when you read this here in verse 18, that's a win-win scenario. That's a win-win scenario, friend. Thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord. I mean, isn't it, doesn't it just feel good to do right? Doesn't it just feel good to do that which is good and right? Then I have to live your life doing this, just always looking over your shoulder, wondering if you're going to get caught, wondering if it's going to catch up with you down the road, you know, or if you're going to have to pay the piper someday for, you know what I mean? If something's going to catch up on you, uh, you're not going to, you know, not losing sleep at night over something you did. You know, it's, it feels good to just do that which is right in the sight of the Lord thy God. Yeah. To have a clear conscience and to be right with God. That's a win. Mark that day up as a win. In the sight of the Lord. And then it goes on, and it's a win-win because he says, if you do that, that it may be well with thee. God will bless you for doing the right thing. You know, doing the right thing is its own reward, but then God just, you know, he adds blessing on top of it. He looks down and says, hey, this guy's doing right. He's trying to live right. He's got integrity. He, he, he's, he's trying to be a blessing. He's keeping the commandments, the judgments, the statutes. He's following the Lord thy God with all his heart. And he's, you know, and that in and of itself, you know, is for your own benefit. It's going to help you. And then God looks down and blesses it too. It's a win-win. The Bible says in 1 John 5, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. <clears throat> oh, loving God is so hard. You've got to keep His commandments. It goes on and says, And His commandments are not grievous. His commandments are not grievous. You know, His commandments uh, make life good. <coughs> they make life easier, not harder. I mean, I know sometimes we have to take stands and we have to suffer persecution and things like that for the Word of God. But by and large, just, you know, living by God's commandments and keeping his commandments, they just make life better yeah, that's right. in and of themselves. <clears throat> you know, we're not going to have the problems the world has. That's what just dumbfounds me sometimes about people who, who just don't get it. They just mock the things of God. 
Then you look at their life and they just have all, I'm not saying the Christian life is perfect, but we don't have a lot of the problems the world has. We don't have a lot of the problems they have. If we're doing right, if we're living by the word of God, we don't have the problems with all the problems they have. I mean, we could go down the list. The drugs, the alcohol, the crime, the violence, it, just, it goes on and on. And, you know, and, and again, we could, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but this is just a quick point. His commandments are not grievous yeah. because they actually bless us. You know, God's not out there just trying to rob you of a good time. You know, saying, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that. Like, God's just, you know, trying to make sure, that, you know, you, you just don't have any fun. Right? Is that what God's about? No, God's trying to keep you out of a bad time, yeah. out of a bad one. Because what a world calls a good time often adds, ends very badly. There's a lot of repercussions that come with that. You know, you start out at the party, you know, woo, and the bottles are getting passed around, everyone's having a good time. You know, God says you shouldn't even look at that stuff, the alcohol. Amen. You know, everyone's getting drunk. It's a good time. It's a good time until somebody gets behind the wheel and then crashes into a tree. And, you know, I had a friend growing up in high school, and I went to his funeral when I was 18 and 19 years old, and he was at a party having a good time, quote, unquote, and he got into a car and smashed into a tree or a telephone pole. I can't remember which it was, and his car ignited, and it was a closed casket. Now, do you think that's what they thought? Well, that's, that's a good time. You think that's what they were planning on happening? But do we have that problem? If we keep the commandments of the Lord God, we say, hey, I'm not even going to look at it, let alone put a bottle to my lips. I'm not even going to look at it. Right. You know what? You just brought your chances of getting drunk behind a wheel to zero Amen. by obeying the commandments. And it's not God just trying to rob you of a good time. It's God trying to keep you safe. That's right. It's God trying to keep you from being, you know, some preacher's illustration years away from down the road. Yeah. I remember this one guy, you know. <clears throat> so, you know, don't, his commandments are not grievous. God's not just trying to rob you of a good time. He's trying to keep you out of a bad situation. We'll go on here. Verse 19. He says, uh, To cast out all thine enemies from before thee as the Lord hath spoken. And when thy, uh, thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, what mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord thy God hath commanded you? Again, bringing up the next generation. That's what this chapter is about, teaching the next generation. And he says, uh, verse 21, Then thou shalt say unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and the Lord showed signs and wonders great and sore upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from thence, and he may bring us in to give us the land which he swore unto our fathers, and the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God and our good, uh, for our good always, that he might uh, preserve us alive as it is this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. So <laughs> really when you look at this, this last passage, I just want to point out a few things here is that, you know, this is, there are some elements in here of, of being a good witness or being a good testimony, Right. That's what he's saying here. He says, look, I want you to be a testimony to the next generation. I want you to be a good witness to them, to tell them of the things that I've done for you so that they don't forget who I am. Now, what are some of these elements here? Look there in verse 21. He says, Then thou shalt say to the son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen. You know, it's, it's good to always remember that God of God's deliverance. You know, don't ever forget the fact that if you're saved, what God saved you out of? Yep. You know, hell. You know, <laughs> the wages of sin is death. You know, that right there is something to rejoice about and to, be, to remind the next generation, look, hell is real. You need to be delivered from sin. So not only does God deliver them, you know, uh, uh, God's deliverance, but look at verse 23. He says, and he brought us out from thence that he may bring us in. Why did God deliver them? Just so they could wander around in the, in the land? No, God wanted to immediately bring them into the promised land. God wanted to bless them. So that's the other part of it. Like, look, you know, God... God delivered us, God saved us from our sins, and now he's blessing us. You know, when we keep God's commandments and we do these things and God's blessing us, this is all a good testimony. You know, our, our, the next generation should be able to look at our lives and see that and say, hey, there's a people that got saved and God's blessing them. It should be evident. These are the elements that are there. And, and you know, another element that we can't forget about is obedience. Look at verse 24. And the Lord commanded us to do these statutes to fear the Lord. You know, we want to be that good testimony. We want to be a good, make a good impression on the next generation. It's going to require obedience to the Word of God. So, <coughs> here's the thing. You know, this, this, 
This chapter should remind us that God cares not only for this generation, but the one that's going to follow. God has his eye not only on, on this generation, but the next one that's coming up behind it. He cares for both. I mean, it, it's throughout this chapter. It bookends it, right? He says in verse 7, Thou shalt teach them unto thy children. And in verse 20, and, thou, and when thy son asketh thee in the time to come. Look, he's bringing this up over and over again, the importance of teaching the next generation. And it's up to us, this current generation that's at the helm, to teach the things which we have been commanded. And not just teach them, but live them. Do them. Not just talk them, but actually walk in it and do these things. And, you know, the, it, it's just, uh, let me just close by saying that the best way is to live a consistent life that gives glory to God for his blessings. You want to you make an impression on the next generation and help them to walk in the ways of the Lord and to keep his statutes so they don't just fade away? Live a consistent life. Don't be a hypocrite and give God the glory for the blessings that he gives you. Let's go ahead and pray.